This is going to be awesome someday to be standing in the presence of God and be able to sing that holy, holy, holy and be able to do that with every saint that has ever been saved. It will do that with the angels of heaven and just know that, man, we get all of eternity to be right there in the presence of Jesus Christ. That's going to be awesome, isn't it? I cannot wait for that. All right. So you can keep that in mind this morning. And that will probably be good to keep that in mind as we're going to get into our text here in just a minute. Of course, we've been kind of skipping around a little bit, you know, moving Christmas. And then, of course, we got back in 2 Timothy a couple weeks ago. We were off last week. Uh, we're going back in 2 Timothy today. But I want to let you guys know, just kind of as a preview, next week is going to be another a little bit of a different Sunday. Next week is going to be Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. And if you're not familiar with that, we're going to kind of explain what that is all about. Uh, but just kind of giving you just a little advertisement, I guess, about what's going to happen. Uh, we're going to have some different ways of bringing that message to you about the value of all human life. We're going to do that through song. We're going to do that through some video stories and some scripture readings and a special message um, from God's Word. And uh, really, I think it's going to be a great week next week. And I hope that you will plan on being here and being a part of that. Uh, along also, with just a challenge to make sure that you yourself are being involved in the fight for life that is happening here within our nation. Uh, very, very critical time uh, to be a part of that, and we'll be highlighting that uh, together next week. Uh, but today, if you have your Bibles, I encourage you to get them open up to the book of 2 Timothy. We are getting back into our series, Finish Strong, and we are heading to 2 Timothy chapter 3 this morning. So 2 Timothy chapter 3 is where we're going to be. And if you take notes, you get your notes out, get those pens ready. And uh, we got a really interesting section of scripture to work through. And uh, I think maybe it's important for that reason uh, that I start with this reminder today. We here at South Mountain Bible Church, we are committed to a very careful study of the scriptures. And uh, that is why a lot of times you're going to find as we are working through different studies that we're actually going to be working verse by verse through entire books of the Bible most of the time. Uh, just like what we are doing here in the book of 2 Timothy in our series here, Finish Strong. And why, why do that? You know, there's a lot of places in Scripture we could go to. Uh, there's a lot of different methods of studying the Scriptures. Why books? Why verse by verse? Well, really it comes down to this. Starting at the beginning and going all the way to the end, it forces you to deal with every single thing that is written in, a, in Scripture. You don't have a choice. I mean, when I tell you we're studying the book of 2 Timothy and we're going from front to end, you know, it's not like I can just start out at the front and say, hey, we like this section over here and then skip over to the end, you know, we're just going to kind of forget all that, all right? We, we can't do that. That's important because there are times in the scriptures when you're studying that you're going to come across a section that you're just going to think, ugh, really? This is God's word to me? Yes. And by taking that approach where we are working through entire books and we are working verse by verse through them, you can't dodge anything at all. And I want you to keep that in mind this morning. Because we are coming to a passage of scripture that I can tell you right now is not a happy, go lucky, go lucky we're skipping through the tulips kind of word from God. Not in the least. Rather, what it is, it is a warning from him that we're going to have to very carefully listen to. And let me underline that thought for a second. Warnings are only effective if we choose to be aware of them and we choose to heed them. You guys remember the ship to Titanic? 1912, it was considered the greatest human creation up to that point in time. But you guys will probably remember, of course, it's maiden voyage going from England to New York, hit an iceberg, it sank. 1,500 plus people died as a result of that accident. Most people, of course, are familiar with that part of the story. But what a lot, of, a lot of people don't know 
was actually the number of times that the captain and his crew were warned about the amount of ice that was floating in the North Atlantic at that point in time. I mean, we're talking repeated warnings. One as close as 10 minutes before they ran into that iceberg. And they didn't listen to a single one of them. And of course, history tells the rest of the story. So here's the deal. If we are going to be the kind of people who are going to finish strong for Jesus Christ, if our faith is not going to sink to the bottom of the spiritual ocean, per se, we are going to need to be aware of the warning that God's word sounds forth to us today. And what is that warning? Well, it begins with this. Strong finishers are aware immense spiritual decline looms ahead. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 1 says this. It says, but understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty. Not exactly one of those woohoo kind of passages, is it? Very serious tone here. But that's what Paul's trying to make clear to us. He says, you need to understand, you need to realize something, to know it, all right? And the word's actually a pretty intense one there. It's a word that carries the idea of really knowing something, really connecting with this. And it's a continual action. Meaning we're supposed to continue always to be aware of this. And what is it we're supposed to be aware of? He goes on and says, but understand this. He says that in the last days, let me stop there, okay? Here's our time period. Now that's a phrase that's pretty loaded, honestly. It's used a lot of different ways in the scriptures. But here expresses the period of time beginning with the church of Jesus Christ and extending all the way until the day that Jesus comes back. And you know what that means? We're living in the last days right now. So this is a word for us that we're supposed to understand. He continues and says, but understand this, in the last days, there will come. Not maybe, not possibly, not there's a 30% chance, like maybe with the snow today. Total certainty. And what's the certainty about? He says there will come times or seasons of difficulty. We're not talking about just hours and minutes here. We're talking about a period of time with clear markings and the way that it's going to be marked more than anything else, Paul says, is they're going to be difficult or terrible or perilous times. A word that means dangerous, hard to deal with, stressful, serious stuff. And what exactly do these difficult seasons consist of? Look at verse 2. He goes on and he describes them for us in this way. He says, during these times of difficulty, he says, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. And you're like, whoa! Man. I mean, we're not just talking about health problems here. We're not talking about the economy. We're not talking about war even. Paul says to us and to Timothy, he says, during these last days, he says, there is going to be seasons of immense spiritual decline, including in the church of Jesus Christ. True Christianity is going to be clouded by a false form of Christianity. And it's only going to get worse. 
If you look down at verse 13 there in chapter 3, Paul goes on, and we'll talk about this in a couple weeks in more detail, but he says evil people and imposters, he said they're going to go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. In other words, there's phony followers of Jesus Christ. He said they're going to be prevalent and even increasing in number and effectiveness as time goes on. Strong finishers, like what we're striving to be, they're not going to be the norm, but rather the exception. And Paul says to us, he says, expect it. Be aware of it. Be preparing for it. Because in the area of spiritual matters, things are going to get worse. Immense spiritual decline is coming. And in my estimation, honestly, it is already here. And I know he's not going to say that. There's some people thinking, whoa, hold on a minute. I mean, I thought things were getting better for people. I mean, think about all the advances that we've had in the education and technology and medicine and prosperity over the last few centuries that have improved lives. I'm not denying those. That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about spiritual issues. We're talking about matters between us and God. And the Word of God is very clear. On the whole, things are going to get worse and not better. You glad you came to church today? But here's my question. Are you aware of this? Do you understand the immense spiritual decline that's taking place? Does this own your heart as being spiritual reality? I realize this is not what we want to hear. But it's the truth of God and his word of warning to us. And as I mentioned before, warnings that are heard can do a couple of things. They either can paralyze you or they can activate you. And I got to tell you all, this is definitely not a time for us to take the fetal position and just wish everything would go away. Rather, this is a time where you and I should be asking, how do I not get sucked up in all of this immense spiritual decline? How can I finish strong for Jesus Christ? Well, that answer begins with this. Strong finishers are not only aware that it, immense spiritual decline looms ahead, they're also aware Spiritual decline is both recognizable and it's avoidable. Because even as Paul sounds that warning there in verse 1, he said these times of difficulty, he says, they're coming, they're here, we're living in them. He says, you should be able to see them. Notice what he says in verse 2. He goes on and says, for, all right? And notice that little connective. That's important. He's not just throwing out this theory. He's not just throwing out this idea, all right? He's actually going to give us some very specific examples of what he's talking about and how it is that we can see the spiritual decline that we need to be aware of, these times of difficulty. He goes on in verse 2 and he says, For people will be... And let me stop there for just a minute. So again, we're not just talking about philosophies. We're not talking about just ideas. We're talking about recognizable traits that evidence themselves in consistent patterns in people's lives and always indicate spiritual decline. And what are those indicators of spiritual decline in the last days? Well, Paul gives us 18 of them. He says, for people will be, and he starts with this, Lovers of self. I Meaning they're going to live by the philosophy, life is all about me. That's it. I matter. You don't. He says people are going to be lovers of money. Meaning they're going to be greedy for money itself and what it can buy. 
He says spiritual decline is going to show itself and that people are going to be proud, meaning they're boastful. They're going to trumpet themselves. Okay, you know anybody like that? Look at me, I'm great. He said they're going to be arrogant, puffed up, inwardly thinking highly of themselves. It's the opposite of humility. He said they're going to be abusive. Or some of you have the word blasphemers there. Okay, it's a word that means to speak freely of evil of others. Okay, it's the idea of going for the verbal knockout every opportunity that you get. He said people are going to be disobedient to parents. Meaning their actions, their attitudes are looking to usurp God's authority structure in the home. He says people in spiritual decline, he says, are going to be ungrateful. Okay, all take, no thanks. They're going to be unholy. Meaning they have a total disregard for whatever is sacred. He said they're going to be heartless. Or some translations have the word unloving. Meaning they're hard-hearted towards others. He said they're going to be unappeasable or unforgiving. Relational strife? What's that? I don't give a rip. I'm not going to try to solve it. He says they're going to be slanderous. And the word actually carries the idea of malicious gossip. He says they will be characterized of not having self-control. Whatever comes to be their fancy, that's what they're going to do. All right? There's no reason to try to buckle that in or tie that down in any way. He says they're going to be brutal, which actually has the idea of being wild animal-like. He says they're not going to love good, meaning their greatest desire is not for something that is good and right and pleasing to God. Their greatest desire is actually for evil. He said they're going to be treacherous, meaning they're going to have a willingness to betray others if that betters themselves. They're not going to even think a moment about it. He said they're going to be reckless, no consideration of others. They're going to be focused on the moment. They're going to be focused on the thrill. So people during this time are going to be swollen with conceit. Isn't that a great picture? And the idea is they're bloated with their own self-importance. You pop them. So they're going to be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. If I could wrap up our times in a saying better than anything else, that's right there. I mean, people today are all about whatever it is that makes them feel good. That's what they worship. That's what they want. It's not about worshiping the right and true God in any way. You say, man, I mean, that's quite a list, isn't it? And it's not hard to see that in the world around us, is it? It's there destroying relationships. It's there destroying families and businesses and communities. But notice what verse 5 says. He says, these people, all indicated by the spiritual decline, all these characteristics... He says in verse 5, he says, they're going to have the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. You understand what that means? Well, there's absolutely no question that spiritual decline is happening in the world around us, and we can see that. You know what the scariest thing is? The scariest thing is as we move closer to the return of Jesus Christ, spiritual decline is going to be increasingly true of those claiming to be followers of Jesus Christ. That's what it's saying. Because he says they're going to have an appearance or the form of godliness. That word appearance there is a word that means to have a resemblance or to have a look-alike. You guys ever bought a knockoff of a more famous product? You know, you go to the store and they're out of Oreos, and so you get the great value stuff. Doesn't work, does it? Or you think you're getting the Adidas pants, you know, but you get the ones with the four stripes on the side instead of the three, and you know, and they start falling apart in a couple weeks. 
They look like the real thing, but they're not. And that's what Paul says is going to be true of these people who are characterized by this spiritual decline. He says there's going to be a whole lot of them that they look like Christians and they sound like a Christian and they may even do some things that Christians do. They appear to be godly, but instead they're nothing more than knockoffs of the real thing. And he said the reason for that is they've denied the power of Jesus Christ. Their lives are contradicting the power of Jesus that is supposedly resident in them through the Holy Spirit. And it's because there's no moving away from sin. There's no spiritual transformation that's happening internally that's changing them to become like Jesus Christ. Basically what they are is make-believe Christians. Their faith is all show, but there's no reality and there's no substance to it. And you say... Is that really possible? I mean, is it possible that people can be tricked in that way and they can be showing the, like they look like Christians and we probably think that they're Christians, but they're not? And the answer to that is yes. I mean, Jesus himself talked about that. You go to places like Matthew chapter 7 and Matthew chapter 12 and Matthew chapter 13 and Jesus said, you know what? True believers, he said, they will give evidence in their life. There's going to be fruit that will help you be able to recognize them. And he said at the same time, he said there's going to be imposters. And they're not going to always be easy to pick out. But eventually you're going to be able to look at their lives and say, hmm, there's not any fruit going on here. There's no change. There's no becoming like Christ that's going to take place. But again, the point that Paul's making and he's driving home to Timothy, who again is leading a church who probably honestly was in spiritual decline. And the point that he's driving home and he's making to us, he says, is we've got to pay attention. Because sadly, there's many self-professed Christians who are leading and they are filling churches today and they are doing nothing but going through the motions spiritually because their faith in Jesus Christ isn't growing and thriving because it's not really there to begin with. Y'all with me yet? So what are we supposed to do when we come across it? When we come face to face with imposter Christians characterized by this spiritual decline, what are we supposed to do about it? Look at the end of verse 5. What's it say? It says, avoid such people. Whoa. Oh, I want to be clear here, okay? Paul is not saying to us, don't ever make friends with unbelievers. That's not the point at all. Now, I'm going to suggest to you, someone who doesn't know Christ as their Savior, they probably shouldn't be your best friend to begin with, okay? I mean, Paul talks pretty frequently, especially in 1 Corinthians, how bad company corrupts good morals. You might want to think about that. But that's not what this passage is concerned with. We're not talking about unbelievers here. Paul is most concerned about those who are professing Christians. They're saying one thing, but their life is evidencing the opposite. Those who are obviously not living wholeheartedly for Jesus Christ and they are actually beginning to drag you down spiritually as someone who's striving to finish strong for Jesus Christ. Verse 5, that word there, avoid, is actually a really, really strong one. It literally means to make yourself turn away from. I don't know if you guys have ever had this happen, but you ever seen something that's really gruesome? And for whatever reason, you find yourself kind of drawn towards looking at that, and you don't know why. And sometimes when first responders get to a scene and they see what's going on and they see people there and they're just gawking, they literally have to take people by the shoulders and they have to turn them away from looking at that because they know the trauma that can go from dwelling on something like that. 
Okay? That's the idea in this word. It's forcing yourself to turn away from something. And Paul says every believer who's desiring to finish strong for Jesus Christ, they're going to have to force themselves to turn away from people that might be holding them back from finishing strong for him. He says avoid such people. And you say, well, what does that exactly does that mean? First of all, I would suggest to you it begins with taking the risk to honestly and gently confront someone about their sin. I mean, we're staying in the context of what we looked at a couple weeks ago at the end of chapter 2. That's what he talks about. But at the same time, he says, you know what? If they're not willing to repent, they're not willing to turn away from that, that's probably your cue. This is not a person that I should be hanging with. Avoiding people who are characterized by Spiritual decline might mean leaving a church that's not proclaiming the entire truth of God's word in both message and practice. It might involve actually physically removing yourself from a relationship altogether until God changes that person's heart. You say, well, isn't that mean? It might be perceived that way. I mean, isn't that going to make people mad? Possibly. Isn't that going to hurt my reputation? Maybe. Yes. Well, let me ask you, what matters more? Your relationship with spiritual imposters or your relationship with Jesus Christ? Being able to finish strong and to be rewarded in eternity or enjoying a few thrills right now in the present? Heavy stuff. I know. Difficult stuff. I hear you. But again, that's what verse 1 tells us it's going to be like, isn't it? And I think many of us, myself included, we have been very naive about how sinister, mediocre, pretend Christianity can be. It is literally dooming many people to hell and it is dragging down others. And Paul says, when we start to recognize it and we start to see it and he's given us the ways to pick up on that, he says we're to have no part in it. And strong finishers are aware of that. Deep breath. I get it. This is not one of those sermons I look forward to preaching. But again, here's the deal. We've been warned about immense spiritual decline. We've been given tools by God's word to recognize it. But here's another thing that we have to be aware of so we don't get sucked into it. We need to be aware how spiritual decline and its promoters work. And again, the Word of God doesn't leave us in the dark on that. Paul gives us that command there at the end of verse 5. He says, avoid such people. And here's why. He goes on in verse 6 and says, for, okay, there's our connective there. Okay, he's building the thought again. He says, for among them, talking about these people who are characterized by the spiritual decline... He says, for among them are those who creep into households and capture weak women, burdened with sins and led astray by various passions, always learning and never able to arrive at knowledge of the truth. He goes on in verse 8, he says, just as Janus and Jambres opposed Moses, so these men also opposed the truth, men corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith. So notice with me as you look down at those couple verses there, all right? Paul points out two specific ways the promoters of spiritual decline work. And the first is verse 6 and 7 when he says, They prey on those who are spiritually weak. 
and pray, P-R-E-Y, okay? Not P-R-A-Y. They're not praying for them, okay? They're going after them. Because notice what he says. He says, among those, okay, again, these promoters of the spiritual decline, those who are living it out, he says, they creep into households. Very sneaky. Rarely obvious. Now, in Paul's day, most likely that happened by a door-to-door -door kind of thing going on. These false teachers, they would come and they would knock and say, hey, I got some truth for you. Or, hey, I heard that you were struggling with this. Or, hey, I got this new idea. All right? And then they would lay that out. I got to tell you, though, those promoting spiritual decline most likely are not knocking on your doors these days. But you might very much be letting them in when you turn on your TV. Or when you get on your computer and you start scouting around on the internet. Or you go out and you buy the book that's the latest craze that everyone's talking about. Woo, this is a great idea. Paul says these promoters of spiritual decline, he says, they creep. But their goal is very obvious. He said they want to capture meaning to take captive. There's no messing around here. And specifically, Paul mentions weak women. Now, I want to stop on that for just a minute. Because this is one of those passages where we have a lot of people today saying, See? That Paul guy who wrote in the Bible? He was just a male chauvinistic pig. He thought men were better than women. No, okay, that's not what it's going after at all. I believe the, weak, the NIV and the way that it translates this phrase, it calls it weak-willed. It's probably the best way that you could bring this across. Because what Paul is saying, he's talking about those who are vulnerable to spiritual deception. Now in his day, it was more a problem among women because they were at home. They were available to these false teachers. And they didn't, many times didn't have the same level of education as what men did in that culture. Not that they were dumb in any way, not that they were less in any way, but they were more susceptible to those that came along and they had these messages that were being shared and many of them got sucked into it because they were spiritually vulnerable. But let me tell you, that's not just a woman thing. It's not just a woman thing, and that's especially true today. In fact, I would say, on average, probably men are more susceptible to this today because men just don't have the same spiritual interest as women do on a whole. At least in our culture. But Paul says they came, these promoters do, and they creep into their households and they capture these weak women. Why are they weak? They're weak-willed because they are burdened with sins and they are led astray by various passions. In other words, they're the kind of people who feel guilty all the time because they keep doing wrong and they keep doing wrong and they keep doing wrong, but rather than trying to do something to change about it, they just keep doing it. And what they really want is a quick easy out. And let me tell you those, those who are promoting spiritual decline, they're more than happy to give that to people like this. These false teachers are ones who want to come along and yeah, they got a gospel, but it's not about Jesus Christ and the good news that he saves us. It's more about you can save yourself. not about, hey, yes, you're going to stand before God and you're going to be accountable for your sin someday, so let's ship up and let's get our act together here and let's get going on this. No, it's about, no, no, you don't have to really feel guilty about this. It's, it's, it's all going to be okay. It's a bunch of feel-good stuff. What you really need is more positive thoughts, right? That's the way to freedom. Or you just do A and B and C and God's going to love you and God's going to accept you and your life is going to be great. 
or you just send us some money, or you promote our product, God's going to be all about granting your dreams, I promise you. And Paul says those who are spiritually weak and vulnerable, he says they just soak it in. As he says in verse 7, they're always learning, but they're never able to arrive at a knowledge of the truth. You ever met anybody like this? Always input, 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 input. I got the greatest, the latest, whatever's happening, whatever the greatest idea is now. Until next week. And then it's something the week after that. And it keeps changing. And those who promote spiritual decline like this, they know that. I'm just going to toss this in here today, okay? You want to finish strong for Jesus Christ. You need to be a person who resists the urge to simply learn for the sake of learning. Because spiritual decline is avoided, devo- I'm sorry, is avoided by both knowing and applying God's word to your life in real ways. I mean, do you realize the Bible itself says that knowledge, even Bible knowledge, doesn't guarantee that you're going to be spiritually growing and maturing? It doesn't. James says it's when we become doers of the word that that happens. Jesus says it's when we take the word of God and we allow it to be our rock because we're acting on it that changes us. But Paul says those who are strong finishers, he said they're, he's, they're aware. These promoters of spiritual decline, they're preying on those who are spiritually weak. And then he goes on verse 8, and he says, secondly, they're also characterized by sneakily opposing the truth. He says there, just as Janus and Jamres opposed Moses, so those who also, these men also oppose the truth, men who are corrupted in mind and disqualified regarding the faith. So verse 8, we come across a couple names. And you're probably thinking, hmm, who are these guys? Janus and Jambres. I don't remember reading them about them in the Bible before, and that's probably because you haven't. Okay? This is the one place they get mentioned. And what it is, is it's a reference to Jewish tradition that claims that these two men were magicians in Pharaoh's court back at the time of Moses when he went in and he told Pharaoh, you're supposed to let my people go. That's God's word to you. And remember when he did that, God gave him the ability to do a couple of miracles. Okay? He could put his hand in, he could do the leprosy thing, he could throw a staff down and it would become a snake. Well, the word of God actually tells us that some of Pharaoh's magicians were able to imitate some of those miracles. Okay, Jewish tradition says Janus and Jambres were those two guys. They opposed God by opposing Moses. And what Paul does is he grabs that understanding and he makes a comparison. He says, just as those guys opposed Moses, he says, so these promoters of spiritual decline, he says, they also oppose the truth. Meaning that there are a lot of messengers, a quote-unquote messengers of Jesus Christ today, they're doing just like Janice and Jambres were. They're putting on a pretty good magic show. They say a lot of interesting and memorable things. They seem to have countless testimonies of how they help people and make them feel good. Many times they become very popular and very quickly, and they hold large followings. But Paul says there's a problem with that. Because he said they're corrupted in mind. They're opposing the truth. And when you start to look closer at the things that they are teaching, guess what? They don't square up with God's word, do they? When you start looking at their lives and their character, you find that it displays corruption rather than models Jesus Christ and encourages you to act like him. And Paul says at the end, he says, as far as God's concerned, these guys are already already disqualified. They're out of the race. 
They're sneaky. They're not always easy to recognize. But they oppose the truth. Sobering. Disturbing. But, you guys ready for a good word finally? Here's the last thing that Strong Finisher is aware of today. Strong Finishers are aware there's absolutely no need to despair. Because Paul finishes off the section this way. He says, but they, okay, these corrupt, disqualified, spiritually inclined individuals, he says they aren't going to get very far. For their folly is going to be plain to all as it was of those two men, referring back to Janus and Jambres, who he's already talked about. I love this. <laughs> because finally, in this rather negative passage, we get to an incredible word of encouragement and hope about spiritual decline and its promoters. God says very clearly, he says, don't worry about them. They're going to get exposed. I mean, that's what happened to Janus and Jambres. Their foolishness became evident because they were unable to produce all the miracles that Moses did. He kept going. Everyone saw them for the fakes that they were. And God says the same thing about these spiritual decline promoters. He said, I've got a way of bringing them to light. You're to see them as false teachers. You're to see their false message. And I'm going to do that time and time and time again. I mean, just like the old adage says, truth and time... They walk hand in hand. And that is especially true when God is involved here. Because God is zealous for his word. And he is zealous for his truth and for his people. And he ultimately will win the victory over spiritual decline. And strong finishers, they rest in that victory. They don't worry about all the problems that come from living in times of immense difficulty. Because you know what? God's got it. Okay? And in the end, God wins. Amen? And if you have any doubt about that, all you have to do is you have to look at the cross of Jesus Christ and his resurrection. If he can beat sin, and he can beat death, let me tell you, he can certainly handle spiritual decline and its promoters. Let's instead choose to be strong finishers. And let's instead choose to concentrate on being aware of the immense spiritual decline and avoiding it and striving to finish strong for Jesus Christ. And Father, again, we thank you for the opportunity to be in your word today. Not an easy word by any stretch of the imagination, but a warning that has come across very clearly from the pages of your scriptures. Lord, we're living this. And we've got to be on our toes. Help us to be aware of the spiritual decline. Help us to recognize it. Help us to make the commitment to avoid it. Help us to be sure to stand against those who are promoting it when the time comes and it becomes necessary. And most of all, help us to trust you. You're the winner. And we want to be among those who are going to be winning with you because we have chosen to finish strong for Jesus Christ. Help us to be about that starting this week. We pray these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen.